In our journey over the last few weeks through the book of Revelation, we have met horsemen, armies of locusts, fearsome beasts, that enormous fiery dragon, angels who blow trumpets, angels who pour out bowls of wrath, and many other creatures and objects. And we've seen how uh, the meaning of those is revealed mostly by noticing that those symbols have already appeared in the Old Testament and, in the, uh, and on the lips of Jesus. But although we've seen all of that, we might still ask, what is the book about? When you boil it down, what is it about? What would you say to someone who asked you to give an answer in just one sentence? What is the book of Revelation about? Some have said the book is about Jesus wins. And, well, that's true. That may be a little too short, a little bit short on information. Let me just expand that a little bit. How about this? The book of Revelation is about how Jesus brings down one city and raises up another. It's about how Jesus brings down one city and raises up another city. The calamitous fall of a city is the theme of what Alison's just read from Revelation 18. And if you glance your eyes over it, it is the theme of Revelation 17 as well. Revelation 18 is this poignant lament over the city that is called Babylon the Great. But that's not the first mention of a great city whose doom has been coming uh, in this book. <clears throat> All the way back in chapter 14, after the seven trumpets sounded, announcing the beginning of judgment, we read this. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. This has been a theme uh, for quite a few chapters. And after the pouring out of the seven bowls, filled with the plagues, the blows, the strikes that complete God's wrath, Revelation 16, the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. And now we have two whole chapters, 17 and 18, about the fall of this great city. In two weeks' time, we're going to come to chapter 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the book. And there we'll meet another city described in detail, a city that shines with the glory of God. So unlike this city, Babylon, that is brought down, that city that we're going to get to in a couple of weeks has an eternal and glorious future. God brings down one city and he raises up another. Well, for today then, we're not going to think about the other city. We'll get to that in two weeks' time. We're going to think about the first city, the one that God brings down. And we're going to ask three questions. Who is she? Why did this happen to her? And what was it that became of her? First of all, who is she? She's not Babylon, despite the name. Babylon was long gone by the time uh, of the New Testament, destroyed by the Persians in 539 BC. So the name Babylon is now a symbol. It stands for another city. And this city is pictured, if you look at the start of chapter 17, she's pictured as a woman and actually a woman of a particular kind, a prostitute. Chapter 17, verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes 
and of the abominations of the earth. So she's a woman, she's a prostitute, but on her forehead she has the name Babylon. She is a city as well. Now, the last few weeks I've uh, had a little diagram up about the, the four main ways of thinking about the book of Revelation and when these things that are spoken of, when they are fulfilled. Uh, I haven't got the diagram for you today because I forgot to put it in the PowerPoint, but maybe you know it off by heart anyway. So first of all, if you were a historicist, if you're someone who sees the things in the book of Revelation um, mapping onto history, being played out one by one down through the centuries. Well, those who were historicists noticed that this woman or this city appears to be religious. Maybe she's a city, maybe she's a church. Uh, she's someone who leads others <coughs> into idolatry. And so in the 16th century, in the 17th century, they naturally thought that she was the corrupt Roman Catholic Church of their time. And actually in verse 4, she's dressed in purple and scarlet, just like the bishops and the cardinals. The idealists would say, no, she stands for the world system that in every age tries to seduce the godly. Or she represents powerful religions, perhaps worldwide religions or denominations that lead people astray by their false teaching about God. She represents the powers that keep corrupting and damaging society and that have to be resisted in every age. If you're a futurist thinking that the fulfillment of the book of Revelation all, all, is all going to happen in, the, in a few years leading up to the return of Christ, then you would say this woman or this city, she must represent a great apostate religion that is going to form under a godless world government in the end times and which will be destroyed at the return of Christ. But as I've been pointing out week by week, Revelation, it says, is a vision given to show Christians what must soon take place. And if you believe it was written in the AD 60s, as I do, then it's got to be something within a few years of that. I believe that Babylon must be a code for a city, or something anyway, in the first century. It's certainly true that false religions and false churches that deny the gospel have, have arisen in every century and they're always with us. And they will share many of the characteristics of this harlot city. And yes, we can learn what to be on the lookout for in our day so that we are not deceived. And we can be encouraged to trust Jesus that he will win. He will win against even the most idolatrous and powerful deception. So we can certainly apply these passages in every age. But applying them in our age is different from saying, well, what are they actually about? And to the preterist, the preterist, the pastist, the one who thinks that most of the fulfillment is in the past already now, Babylon must be something in the first century. Now, some have said she was Rome. That's the obvious powerful city of that time, isn't it? But I explained last time why I think actually she is Jerusalem. Back in chapter 11, we had the first mention of a great city. It says the great city figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. That's chapter 11, verse 8. Well, there's only one city where their Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is being called Sodom. She's become like Sodom in her uh, immorality. And she's like Egypt, the nation that tries to kill uh, God's son. And I'm saying that this is showing us that she's not only like Sodom and Egypt, she's also like Babylon of old the city at the heart of the empire that persecuted God's people. Chapter 17, verse 3, we notice she's sitting on a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. You should recognize that. That's the description of the beast from the sea that we found in Revelation 13, who I said was Rome. 
personified by Nero, her emperor, Mr. 666. And so we're seeing a, a, a woman or a city that sits on the beast, the beast representing Rome. Just quickly, um, if you've read through this this week, you may have noticed the, the words, uh, the verses, chapter 17, verse 8 onwards, and wondered what all that is about, the explanation of the heads and the horns and so on. How can that be a description of Rome or of Nero? <clears throat> verse 8 talks about how the beast impresses the inhabitants of the land, that is, uh, the Jews, impresses them with something like a resurrection miracle. In what sense did Rome die and was raised again, or Nero, or any of the other emperors? Well, it may refer to AD 69. That was the year of the civil war within uh, Rome, of the, the battling that led to f having them... F they had four uh, emperors in very quick succession. Some were murdered, some committed suicide. There was a sense in which the empire had fallen apart, died, and then recovered again. Maybe that's what it's about. I'm tentative about that. Verse 9 talks about seven hills, and Rome is famously built on seven hills. Verse 10 talks about seven kings, which may refer to the first seven emperors. As John writes, five of them have already ruled and, and, and uh, died. One is, that would be Nero, and there's, there's one to follow him. Verse 12, the ten other kings may refer to the rulers of the ten Roman provinces. So that's tentative, but I think there are ways of seeing how these verses are talking about Rome. Well, if the beast is Rome, who is the woman who sits or rides on the beast? Surely she can't be Rome as well. It would make more sense if she is Jerusalem riding Rome. In other words, drawing her power from Rome conspiring with Rome to get what she wants most. For example, the killing of the one who claims to be the Christ, or the killing of his followers. Chapter 17, verse 6 says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints, those who bore testimony to Jesus. That is more true of Jerusalem than Rome until the late uh, 60s when Rome did begin to persecute Christians Revelation 18.24 says in her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth or the land assuming those prophets are the Old Testament prophets which city where would you go to find the blood of the prophets that was Jerusalem that shed the blood of the prophets as Jesus pointed out so who is she I think she's Jerusalem. Why did all this destruction come upon her? Why did this happen? And in one word, the answer would be unfaithfulness. Why would God judge and bring down Jerusalem? The main charge here in chapter 17 is that she is a prostitute. She's committed adultery with the kings of the earth and led the inhabitants of the land into adultery. Well, in what sense has she done this? This is talking about spiritual adultery, unfaithfulness to God. In the Old Testament, with I think just two exceptions, every time there are accusations of, of spiritual adultery, unfaithfulness, they are all directed at Jerusalem or Israel. You see, God had made a covenant with Israel. He'd pledged himself to her as her husband. The other nations were never in that kind of covenant with God. So the other nations are judged for their wickedness, but they're not judged for unfaithfulness. They can't be unfaithful to someone they were never married to. It's Israel is the one who was pledged to God as his holy bride. And she's the one who turned to other lords and other gods, that was her unfaithfulness and her spiritual adultery. So the language here in chapter 17 fits with that. Moses said, they made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. In the book of Judges, whenever the judge who's leading Israel dies, 
it says that the people then prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. The prophet Jeremiah says, Like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you have been unfaithful to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. And there are lots and lots more examples of that kind of language in the Old Testament. So what is the message of the book of Revelation? God brings down one city and raises up another. Or, put it another way, God divorces his unfaithful wife and marries another. And that other one is the focus of the last couple of chapters of the book. You might say to me, doesn't God hate divorce? Why would he do that? Do you remember what Jesus said about divorce? He said, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. But marital unfaithfulness would be a justification for divorce according to Jesus. Israel, Jerusalem, they were warned again and again what would happen if they kept being unfaithful to their God. And the Old Testament records the extraordinary patience of, of her Lord. He repeatedly takes back his wayward bride. He gives her another chance, but now she has gone too far. Or in slightly different imagery, God intended that Israel would be married to his son. She was betrothed to him, but when the son arrived to claim his bride, she didn't want to enter into the marriage. Instead, she rejected him and killed him on a cross. That was the message of that first reading from Galatians chapter 4, that Paul says that Jerusalem has become like, not Isaac, but like Ishmael, the son of the slave woman, because she is in slavery. And then he says, but there is another Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem, and she is the one who is free, and she is the one that Christians belong to. So what happened to unfaithful Jerusalem, <coughs> or Babylon, as she's called here, that is a warning to anyone who thinks that he can be unfaithful to Jesus without consequences. To anyone who thinks he can make Jesus less important than another God, or another person, or another goal in your life. It's a warning to anyone who thinks that you don't need to obey Jesus' words above all others. It's a warning to every individual, every one of us, to every person, to every family, to every village, every nation, every church, every denomination. As you probably picked up this week, a majority of the bishops of the Church of England are determined to lead our denomination into deeper disobedience to Jesus' clear words. Well, do they not care if God rejects or divorces or destroys our denomination? Who is she? Jerusalem. Why did it happen? Because of her unfaithfulness. The third question, so what became of her? Certainly a lot of suffering. That's spoken about in chapter 18, verse 7 and 8, in the middle of that lament terrible suffering. But perhaps the clearest description of her calamity would be the word desolation. That's the word that Jesus used when he spoke about these things. Luke 13, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. That word means abandoned or empty. It's from a word that means desert or wilderness. And chapter 18 that Alison read, that uh, poignant lament, it speaks of the great wealth of Jerusalem, the great riches of her life. Uh, all gone. Judaism had spread throughout the Roman Empire. They'd built synagogues in everywhere. They'd obtained special exemptions 
so they didn't have to worship the Roman gods and they could carry on worshiping their god. They had come to depend on the beast, on Rome, for power. They were cunning enough to obtain all kinds of material privileges from their empire and trade. But in the end, in God's purposes, this beast that the woman rode on turned on her. Have a look at the last two verses, no, the last three verses of chapter 17. 17 verse 16. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. And that is what happened. Jerusalem rebelled against the Roman rule. The Romans sent legions. They besieged the city. Uh, that lasted for several years with immense suffering. And then finally in AD 70, they overpowered and destroyed the city. This chapter 18 is a lament for Jerusalem. Speaking about all the things that will be torn out of her forever. Verse 11, her wealth, her trade. Verse 14, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. Verse 22, the music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. And so on. I mentioned before, if you want to read about the history of those events, then the best person to turn to is Josephus, who was an eyewitness of these things and very much involved with them, and who wrote this book, The Jewish War. Here's a bit where he describes the final day uh, of the uh, um, overthrow of Jerusalem. Masters now of the walls, the Romans set up their standards on the towers and with clapping and singing celebrated their victory, having found the end of the war much easier than the beginning. They had surmounted the last wall without losing a man. It seemed too good to be true. And when they found no one to oppose them, they could make nothing of it. They poured into the streets, sword in hand, cut down without mercy all who came within reach, and burnt the houses of any who took refuge indoors, occupants and all. Many they raided, and as they entered in search of plunder, they found whole families dead, and the rooms full of the victims of starvation. Horrified by the sight, they emerged empty-handed. Pity for those who had died in this way was matched by no such feeling for the living. They ran every man through whom they met. At dusk, the slaughter ceased, but in the night, the fire gained the, fire gained the mastery. And on the next day, the sun rose over Jerusalem in flames. A city that during the siege had suffered such disasters that if she had enjoyed as many blessings from her foundation, she would have been the envy of the world. You see, 17 and 18, chapter 17 and 18, are talking about the end of Israel as the covenant people of God. And from that time on, the covenant people of God are clearly and unmistakably those who are joined to Christ, whether they're Jew or Gentile. What happened to Jerusalem in AD 70 was a seismic event, a shaking of the whole fabric of the world. As we move very clearly and obviously from old covenant to new covenant, from old creation to new creation, from old world to new world. Chapter 18, verse 4, the voice comes from heaven, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her 
plagues. When Christian faith looks foolish, when it appears that there might be more wealth or success or comfort or satisfaction by serving something or someone other than Jesus Christ, these chapters tell us don't be tempted by that. God can bring down even this great city. When it looks like you can't stand against the world because of the pressure you're under, you can't stand against the world without suffering great loss, these chapters tell us not to be afraid. God can bring down even Babylon the Great. He brings down and he raises up. That, I think, is the message of Revelation. God brings down one city and raises up another. The old was shaken to the core so that the new could fully come. And as it says in the book of Hebrews, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Shall we pray?